Okay, so before we get into the review of this new Jenny Bones album, just want to put up a trigger warning here. There is a trigger warning associated with the entire album, especially two songs in particular, that was posted on the band's social media page. Basically, if you're likely to be triggered by discussions of mental health and suicide in particular, then this might not be your cup of tea, just saying that now. Okay, now that's out of the way, let's talk about this new Jenny Bones album, Pushback. Jenny Bones is one of those bands where I look at the overall sound, style, and aesthetic and wonder why they aren't a thousand times bigger than they actually are. After all, they're an indie pop group that has hooks, the colourful production that combines 80s synth pop with pop rock at its most shimmering and slick, and songwriting from frontwoman and soul member Kelsey Galuzzo that will put most in the subgenre to shame. So that begs the question, why is this band not huge? Well, I've been contemplating that question for a while and I think I've come to some sort of conclusion. Kelsey Galuzzo's intensely personal song writing can be just as much a blessing as it is a curse. Take their previous EP Hyphen as an example. It's a concept album about Galuzzo escaping an abusive relationship, painted with all the messy humanity that might really underscore a situation like that. She describes being gaslit into thinking it was her fault, being frustrated at her partner's refusal to offer up any kind of explanation, and trying to separate her real experience from what she's made up in her own head in her desire for some kind of internal escape. There's no way around the fact that this is heavy stuff. It's enough of a reason on its own where I could completely understand why someone might be hesitant to approach this group and that album in particular, especially given the very plain spoken language with which Galuzzo approaches discussing these ideas, which only ends up enhancing the universality of the themes and reinforces that idea that the protagonist on that album could be anyone anyone could be going through that. In a lot of ways it felt too personal. It raises the question of whether or not it's even possible to effectively contextualise art that falls into this emotional territory, should you even review it. It's challenging in a way that shocked me and made me simultaneously look forward to and kind of dread covering this new album Pushback, especially if Galuzzo was going to stay in this emotional territory with her songwriting. I was expecting a great album, make no mistake, but I did have some reservations going in. While I liked the song That's All when I reviewed it on my web show a few weeks back, it's also a song that didn't quite land with the heavy punch that I was expecting. I was hoping that it picked up more impact for me within the context of the album. So with all that out of the way, let's get to that album. How is Pushback? Well, to contextualise how I really feel about this album, I want to refer back to that social media post, that trigger warning, and something that was kind of attached to it, regarding the artistic intent of this album. It refers to the objective of the album being to go some way towards continuing to normalise the conversation around mental health. And if you're assessing this album on simply how well it achieves that objective, the album, well, it succeeds on pretty much every level. In a perfect world, Pushback would be the kind of album that pop nerds will be talking about for years and decades to come. It's the kind of sledgehammer to the gut masterpiece that might never occur again in an artist's career. And the fact that Kelsey Galuzzo and her collaborators managed to achieve this on the band's debut studio album, it says a lot about what Kelsey Galuzzo might achieve long term. In other words, this is very special and we'll get onto why now. And the easiest place to start unquestionably is with Kelsey Galuzzo herself as a performer. The bottom line is she is a great singer and at no point on this album is her sincerity ever in doubt. As a result, every word on this album feels essential and personal to her. It helps that she also proves herself to be a surprisingly dynamic presence behind the microphone. She's at her most expressive on songs like Ravine and Bad Trick, while Dolly and Bug Life have her playing for a little bit more subtlety. And yeah, she's equally convincing in both roles. And I can't even begin to express how important that is on an album like this. Galuzzo is, after all, juggling some very big emotions on this album, so the fact that she can sell all of them says a lot about her skills. Be it the frustration of not knowing the way forward in a relationship or nothing, the total emptiness of Ravine, or the absolutely devastating close of Bug Life, that we'll get into more detail on later on, don't you worry. Again, Galuzzo's ability as a performer cannot be overstated. It also helps that her vocal production is polished, without feeling as overly sanitized as you might expect, meaning that the humanity in the complicated situations that Galuzzo sketches out is always foregrounded. There's no obvious auto-tune or pitch correction, just tight multi-track vocals when they're needed to support her in the mix. This allows her vocals to really stand out on some of these songs, and helps her develop her own unique, organic presence as a singer. And given how personal the album gets, that's only a good thing, considering how much it helps that sense of authenticity. I will say that I'm not entirely sure she's the best fit alongside Eric Egan of Heart Attack Man on Bad Time, as Galuzzo's sweet, strident vocals don't really mesh well with 
Egan's more nasal tones that he's clearly ringing over from pop punk. But that song still works for me because it plays an essential role in the thematic arc of this album that yes, we will get into in a bit. But before we get to that, we need to talk about the production on this thing. And it's pretty much exactly what I described earlier. A sugary, sweet blend of synth pop and pop rock where the guitars are watery, the synths are bright and glamorous, and the percussion is tight and punchy. There really is not a lot you can say about a remarkably streamlined project that's consistently well produced from start to finish. I will say that there is a part of me that's a little disappointed we didn't get real drums more consistently on more of these songs. But given how much this album is borrowing from 80s inspired synth pop, perhaps I shouldn't even be surprised. After all, it's not like the drum machines are badly blended or anything, quite the contrary. In fact, it's that percussion blending as a whole that gives songs like Nothing and Taking Up Space that glorious galloping energy and makes them so infectious. But speaking of infectious, well, that might as well be the word of the day when describing this album, as it might be one of the most relentlessly catchy pop projects of recent memory. There really is is so much to love here. I love how much glittery swell the spiky pianos have on nothing that will eventually materialize into a kick-ass saxophone solo that will later be echoed on the smoky, desolate, reverb-soaked ravine, or how even outside of the comparison in vocal timbres, the ukulele ballad Dolly doesn't sound like it would be too out of place on a Casey Musgraves album circa 2015, and that is high praise indeed. Of course, musically, if not lyrically. And the album ends with a spectacular one-two punch. The washed-out blur of guitars and mammoth hook on Bad Trick, and the sparse melody that anchors the incredible closer Bug Life. Even the songs I'm not quite as much of a fan of, like That's All and Bad Time, the more off-kilter and jittery, they ended up growing on me a lot because they are just that catchy. Similar case for everything that might be the closest this album gets to conventional pop with the hazy melodies and the trickling hi-hats. There is not a dud within a mile radius of this album, and each song is bursting with unique personality and character. It's just about 30 minutes of pure, unfiltered, sugary pop energy, and that is it. But that's what the album is doing musically, and if anything, that musical approach might actually lead to the album's thematic arc landing with even more weight. And yes, now we get to the main event. We get to talk about the songwriting on this album. This really is the selling point. This is an album set on the precipice of total self-destruction. It's about mental health, depression, suicide, the difficult decisions we make when societal pressures are at play, and the challenges that can be involved in simply being happy. The opening track Waking Up Crying illustrates this perfectly, highlighting the extent to which happiness either is or isn't a conscious choice, as she clearly just wants to laugh off this awkward situation that she's got herself into in a relationship, but just can't muster the energy to and ends up waking up crying every time. And as for that awkward situation, well it appears that Galuzzo's partner is starting to lose feelings for her, with their negative disposition having a considerable impact on their relationship. And it also becomes increasingly clear that Galuzzo has absolutely no interest in moving on anytime soon. Nothing highlights how even nine months removed from the initial breakup, she still has feelings that are refusing to go away, even going as far to try and guilt trip her ex into coming back to her on that first verse. She clearly isn't painting a likeable picture here, but given how later on in the album it transpires that she's dealing with depression, suicidal thoughts, and way more alcohol than anyone wants or needs. On Waking Up Exhausted, she literally talks about drinking until she's sick, and on Bad Trick, she describes drinking until she ends up passed out on the floor every night. And as that subtext starts to become text later on in the album, her mindlessly clingy behaviour becomes somewhat explainable, if not downright excusable. But to her credit, on the very next song, That's All, it becomes clear that she's at least somewhat on the path to recovery in this relationship. Her feelings are certainly not going to go away anytime soon, but all she's looking for is some reassurance that things can be good between them. If not now, then maybe in the future. But that reassurance gets immediately tested on the next song, Everything, where she was clearly not prepared for how much he has changed. Any attempt she makes to connect with him just gets deflected with resentment. Galuzzo even tries to accuse this guy of living in denial and being too altruistic, even as she admits to lying to him on the opening lines of the song, giving us all the reason in the world why he might not trust her with all of his emotions and feel resentment towards her. Yeah, so in case you haven't got it yet, this album does not paint a pretty picture whatsoever. But the fact that Galuzzo doesn't frame herself as the good guy, that's one thing. But the fact that the album doesn't demand that you sympathize with her in the slightest? That's something entirely different altogether, especially given how emotionally dark this album will get. In a lot of ways, taking up space can be seen as the start of that downward spiral, and where that depression and suicide in the subtext starts to creep in more and more, as she discusses feeling like she's a burden on everyone in her life, and how any recovery, or potential recovery from where she is now emotionally, is probably going to come with some very heavy compromises. Or, as she puts herself, 
It's hard enough to imagine pushing through without imagining the stings. Maybe it would be better to just remove herself from the situation altogether, especially as she feels as though she's just taking up space in other people's lives. Ravine takes that same concept but flips it even more inwardly focused, and the suicidal subtext that coloured the previous song becomes more ingrained in the outright text. She's reached that point where fighting that depression has become so hard that it's now just less of a burden on her to just embrace it as part of her personality and collapse into that ravine amidst all the alcohol. On Bad Time, you literally find out that she's given her identity in her own head some kind of identity. She's given it a name. She's reached that point where instead of fighting it, she's just embracing it. But in between those two songs, you get Waking Up Exhausted, where the extent of her alcohol abuse becomes scarily apparent, as she's continuing to drink until she's sick, but still puts herself through the pain of playing shows in a desperate attempt for some kind of escapism, as she'll then play and sing for people who consider her a positive role model for a reason that she just can't comprehend. And all of that is the reason why Bad Time is such an important song within the thematic arc of this album. Them, as it's the first and only time where the anonymous male voice within the narrative is given some identity, with Eric Egan of Heart Attack Man stepping up to play him directly. Or maybe he's just the embodiment of everyone around her projecting their emotions onto her and just assuming that she's okay because of it. They insist that her heart is pure and she is perfect because those are the qualities that the fans project onto her as they are in search of the perfect role model to look up to. Or, as she says herself, if you say I'm fine, well, that's your agenda, that's you making a projection. In truth, she's the furthest thing from fine, and no song illustrates that better on this album than Dolly. A chipper, bouncy, ukulele-backed country-adjacent track, where Galuzzo decides midway through the song to end her own life, because she's convinced herself that she's long past the point of being savable, and people certainly aren't gonna wake up to the fact that she is suffering, so why not end all of it? She's just gotta make those last preparations and understand how she wants people to grieve. Not that she thinks she'll be missed all that much, though. In her own words, I'll be dead before you even think to save me. This is bleak in a way that pop music just isn't built to be, yet there's a breezy effortlessness to this song and the entire album that not only manages to make it work, but make the picture that's being presented even more devastating, as the innocent pop presentation lends the album a universality that got under my skin so much that's just encapsulated in this track, and Bad Trick might be just as good in terms of painting that deeply personal picture, as she describes finding some kind of comfort in depression because at least it's something consistent that she can rely on. Or Again, in her own words, it's the only thing I can control, even when it's controlling me. It's such a simple line, but in terms of describing the hellscape that is mental health, wow, that is just the perfect way of putting it. And she goes on to describe how ignorant people can be in the discussion of mental health, especially on social media. And as long as you project an image of mental wellness on social media, People are just going to assume you're okay. And if she's the media's idea of a success story, then they must be delusional. As she describes herself as satire with a saviour complex. And she's not getting any better yet, whatever it even means to get better in this situation. So what makes her think that she will ever will as all the emotions that she's experienced in the album collide in a shattering hook? And as if you thought the album couldn't get bleak enough, it ends with Bug Life. A song where the suicide isn't described outright, but it's certainly implied. After all, you can't hold on forever, right? The song encapsulates the core of what the album is about, slipping just over that emotional threshold, the point of no returns, the point where any kind of emotional recovery feels at best kind of distant, and at worst, downright impossible where you slipping over the edge of that cliff into the blackness of the ravine below becomes less of a likelihood and more of a certainty. As the walls just close in around you, what is there to do? What is there left to do other than wallow in your own insignificance one last time before you put an end to all of it? And the album ends very poignantly, I feel, with those voicemail messages. Given how internally focused this album is, for it to spend its final seconds giving a voice to the friends and family in her life who might have the power to pull her out of that descent into the darkness is undoubtedly very affecting. Even if she couldn't see it at the time, they really do care about her. The problem is it might just be too late for that revelation. But Galuzzo makes sure that she gets the last word on the album. I'm sorry. And that's the thing, up until this point in the album, 
It's been ruthlessly direct in its depiction of Galuzzo's downward spiral. So for it to end on a point of lyrical ambiguity like this is fascinating to me. Is she apologizing to the people in her life who we've just heard from for causing them so much worry and pain, implying that an emotional recovery might be possible despite all the odds? Or is she apologizing in advance for what she's about to do? End her own life, inadvertently shifting all of her pain onto them. The album doesn't present you with an answer mainly because it doesn't need to in order to make its point. After all, it's not like there's anything special or unique about the struggles on this album. The dark truth behind all of this is that Kelsey Galuzzo is no different than any number of people her age who are struggling with mental health. These feelings are more than just hers. Again, that universality that's essential to why the entire album works comes to the forefront in a mighty artistic statement. And all of that loops back and comes back around to the point I made earlier about Galuzzo not demanding her audience sympathize with her. Because this is an album that takes an initially unlikable protagonist and ends up crowbarring its audience into sympathizing with her all the same by emphasizing the deeper humanity that underscores the obnoxious, I mean, manipulative clinginess that makes up the first half of the album. Depression is so hard to cope with because we delude ourselves into thinking that we are in control of our own emotions, right? And then we encounter depression and we wonder why we can't just brush it off, make the conscious decision to ignore it and not let it define us, when the deeper truth is that you don't need a reason to be depressed. And coming to terms with that is tough and can cause people to do any number of things. Project an image of fineness on social media to try and deflect all of it. Cling to particular people for fear of ending up alone at the end of it. Or feeling like it's impossible to make any kind of choice about anything as you're certain that all you're likely to end up with is regrets in the end. And the fact that Jetty Bones was able to package all of that emotional weight into an upbeat pop album with hooks, that is flat out breathtaking, just off the scale talent. As you can probably tell, writing this review has been something of an exhausting process. It was always going to be given the subject matter on this thing, but we got through it, I guess. Unfortunately, I'm now left with the issue of how on earth you even rate this album. Under normal circumstances, I'd be inclined to describe this as an album that is fascinating, but emotionally exhausting and draining. That's only likely to be rewarding if you're in a very specific headspace. And while that might be true to an extent, the album is so infectious, again, as a whole, I kind of find it hard to make that criticism all that much. Sure, there are a few flirtations with more conventional pop that I'm not necessarily as keen on, and some jaunty off-kilter production that's not quite to my taste, but the thematic cohesion is so strong and the songwriting so brilliant, this easily gets a 9 out of 10. This album is a must for any pop fan that feels comfortable with the intensely personal songwriting that it brings to the table. It's certainly a demanding listen, but if you're happy with the subject matter, it's an essential one. Definitely check it out. Yeah, so that went longer than expected. I tried to tread lightly when talking about a lot of the heavier themes, but obviously you, you can't avoid talking about those themes with an album like this. Again, I just tried to tread as lightly as I possibly could. But with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the review. I hope you check this album out if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.